morning, everyone, and welcome to panel 17, uh, which will talk about the prospects in enhancing indigenous people's education. So I am Vlad Bumatay, Assistant Professor of Philosophy, and I will be your moderator for this uh, panel session. Uh, in this panel session, we will have uh, three paper presentations that will be delivered by two, this, uh, two esteemed colleagues. So we have uh, the first presenter will be Mr. Jerski Jarzin Doria uh, with his presentation entitled Reflections on Epistemological Standpoints Concerning Indigenous Knowledge in the Contemporary World. Uh, his presentation will be followed by the presentation of Mr. Eric Grande, entitled Indigenous People's Education as a Site for Bridging and Blending Local Knowledge and Academic or Scientific Knowledge. And the last paper he will also present with the title Advancing Education Reform through partnership with senior high schools in indigenous cultural communities. Uh, so before we begin, let me just read some of the uh, reminders from the, from the organizers with regards to the conduct of our uh, panel session. So the first reminder is for the audience to send their questions, if ever you will have your questions, to our chat box. And if you wanted to ask your questions live, you can raise your hand and wait me and wait for me to recognize you before you ask your question on live. Another reminder is for uh, our audience to please unmute themselves in order to minimize uh, the noise coming in in our Zoom meeting. Uh, and also in relation to uh, the Q&A Q part of this session, may we request the, those, the, those people who, were asked, who will ask their questions to raise their questions in a concise and polite manner. <coughs> so without further ado, we can proceed now to the presentation of Mr. Doria. So Mr. Jarski Jersen Doria is a research specialist of Extension Office, Central Luzon State University. He graduated from University of the Philippines Baguio with a degree on Bachelor of Arts in Social Sciences, major in history and minor in political science. He's currently taking his master's degree on rural development at CLSU. He already presented papers in regional and national conferences. His research interests include indigenous and environment studies, indigenous people, local histories, and issues on Philippine politics. Papagpalayang araw sa ating lahat. Hi sa mga viewers natin dyan. I am Jerski Jarzen Duria of Philippine Statistics Authority. And welcome to my video entitled, Reflections on the Epistemological Standpoints Concerning Indigenous Knowledge in the Contemporary World. This paper will focus and offers a reflection on the epistemological perspectives concerning indigenous knowledge, or IK, and in, the, in issues that coincide with indigenous cultural preservation in the age of globalization. As a form of reflection, the arguments in this study were derived from several academic articles and contend, contend in paradigmatic analysis from various intellectuals. So here is Mr. Johnny doing some philosophical reflections and contemplations about life and especially with indigenous knowledge. So this will be the outline of my presentation, which we'll be discussing in the succeeding slides. As an in introduction, let us quote Agrawal 1995. But their knowledge certainly cannot be saved in an archive if they themselves disappear. This quotation of Agrawal pertains to the indigenous people or IPs. And if we will analyze this quotation, we can see here that there are various challenges and struggles which the IPs face and experience, not just in our country, but in the global scale. One of the problems which the IPs face is the loss of land. 
in the status quo, it is a sad fact that even though there are already agencies in protecting the rights of the IPs, specifically the National Commission on Indigenous People, or NCIP, the problem with the land is still in the context, and we can see it in the study of ADB 2002 and Tauli Corpus 2007, as they stated that the IPs are still categorized as marginalized and are living in difficult circumstances brought by loss of land and access to resources. Aside from the problem with the land, the IPs are also struggling to preserve their indigenous culture because of the defining characteristic of the contemporary world, which is globalization. Using the analysis of Tom Linson 2003, where he states that in the cultural sphere has most generally been viewed in a pessimistic light. That is why their indigenous culture and traditions is in the verge of being forgotten. So we encounter globalization in a variety of ways. However, in the cultural setting, the immense power of globalization and modernity is typically associated with the destruction of cultural identities and culture. Tom Linson, 2003. Now that we already categorize or contextualize that the IPs in the present faces various challenges brought by different factors, i.e. globalization and modernity, let us define the various notions regarding indigenous knowledge. So, according to Kalman et al., 2012, IK has been defined in different ways, but it has no universally accepted definition. It has been interchangeably used with other terms such as traditional knowledge, folk knowledge, local knowledge, indigenous practices, and indigenous knowledge systems. So what we can see here is that IK was not only preserved through written document, but majorly through oral tradition. So next, now that we already defined IK, let us define or and discuss the various notions regarding the inter the impacts of indigenous knowledge. So this table came from Lutpa, where he summarized the debates regarding the impacts of indigenous knowledge. So there are three categories, modernism, indigenism, and the third view, or the debunking the myths. So in the modernism, it looks at IK as detrimental to development and, and environmental efforts. Also, there is no scientific element which coincide with it. On the other hand, in Dijonism, where it generally looks at IK as suitable for a sustainable attempt, and it has a scientific component, it also has a view that by conserving IK, it will preserve nature and environment at the same time. Lastly, the third view, where it looks at indigenous and the scientific, that these two ideas and concepts cannot be delineated with each other. So by looking at these arguments, we can reflect and ask, does IK really a beneficial to environment and developmental process, or this just worsen the process? But as the third view suggested, it cannot be delineated with each other. So next, now that the issues and definition of IK has been contextualized, let us now define the various notions regarding globalization which massively affects IPs, IK, and also the phenomenon which currently shapes the globality. So let us start the discussion with the neutral view of globalization. It is seen that with the advent of globalization, the world is becoming borderless. Also in the technologically advanced status quo, time and space not constrained for us to be affected by the events happening in the global scale because we already shared social connect connection and networks. For example, if a calamity hit a specific country and agricultural sector was devastated in that country, the countries which were depending on raw materials from that country will also be affected. However, let us be re reminded that as another view of globalization, it, cannot, it can be characterized in the form of, quote unquote, a double-edged sword, meaning it gives positive and negative impacts in our contemporary world. So for the positive view, globalization integrates market in the global scope where the flows of information and ideas gives beneficial effect on different countries. However, on the critical view, as Core and Wallerstein stands, 
it was used by the powerful nation states to exploit the weaker ones in terms of their resources, which can be characterized in the form of quote-unquote colonization or neo-colonization. So the challenge now is what edge of the sword should we go on? Or what edge is sharper in today's context? So in the cultural setting, basically uh, cultural globalization is in the context. So in this analysis, it directly implies the negative impacts of globalization, specifically in the cultural perspective, which directly gives an impact to indigenous communities where their distinct cultural identity and cultural practices were challenged and on the edge of being forgotten. With the continuous domination of the global market, economy, and trade, where most of things comes with a price, even indigenous cultures were on the bench of being commoditized and commodified. Now that we already have defined the key terms of this paper, the next discussion will be on the issues and challenges of indigenous knowledge in the bench of globalization. So, according to Dove, 2006, where he posited that modernity helped to popularize indigeneity and at the same time threaten it. We can see here again the duality of modernity or the globalization. However, as Smith 1999 argues that it contributed various challenges to IPs. One of the challenges which the IPs experience is about their distinct IK because Western knowledge is dismissive on the capacity of IK which leads to the dichotomy between the indigenous knowledge and the Western knowledge. But let's remind them that the dichotomy between the two has been debated not just in the status quo but even the earlier anthropologies such as Malinovsky, Boas, Levi Bro, Moss, Evans, Pritchard, Horton, and Levi Strauss, according to Agrawal 1995. However, what we need to understand here is that the primary aim of IK and the rise of IK in the recent literature is to decolonize research. Going back to the dichotomy between the two concepts, the issue between the two knowledge is that Western knowledge is ignoring dismissing and undervaluing the capacity of IK because it focuses on the everyday life of people while Western knowledge concentrates on the investigative aspect of the world. However, both terms has been in an intimate interaction with each other since the 15th century, so it is difficult to adhere to view of indigenous and Western forms of knowledge being untouched by each other. So as an example, Dub 2000 writes, in the case of smallholder rubber cultivation in Southeast Asia, closer study reveals that although this is indeed an impressive system of agroecological knowledge, it could hardly be less indigenous in nature. But what we need to understand is that both concepts have various ways of knowing the world. Let us move on on the next issue regarding the rise and fall of IK. So basically, based on this process, it is evident that the growing developmental researches on IK manifest that it is a vital aspect of development. It also became a platform to give voices to marginalized sectors and communities. But with the growing influence of modernity, IK is in danger because it is not practiced anymore specifically by younger generations. The newly introduced technologies on livelihood, fishing, and agroforest production might give way for the IPs to forget their culture and traditions. In this sense, the challenge is on us. Should we take another step on helping them to preserve their culture or another step to forget it? So another issue in the contemporary world is about the indigenous knowledge and indigenous cultural preservation of IK. Because IK is slowly vanishing today, and that's the truth, because of modernity and cultural globalization. That is why there are growing developmental researches and preservation and documentation of IK, or also called as the IKSPs. As Agrawal pointed out, if indigenous knowledge is disappearing, it is primarily because of pressures of modernization and cultural homogenization. 
which threaten the lifestyles, practices, and cultures of indigenous peoples. However, the open access of knowledge may not be appropriately applied to indigenous knowledge. But the question is, why? If we will analyze, IK is vulnerable to exploitation. So listed here are some of the cases that companies, scientists, and even academicians use IK for their own gain. The problem here is the knowledge which should be benefiting the IPs to improve their economic conditions were used by external people, quote-unquote external people, at the expense of the IPs who possess that knowledge. As one example, POSI 1996 claimed that academics and scientists who record IK have enhanced their careers by doing IK research, improving both their status and salaries. Also, the study of Rural Advance Advancement Foundation International, 1994, argued that the companies in the agricultural and pharmaceutical sectors have used indigenous knowledge about plants and animals to manufacture new drugs, crop species, and other commercial products, resulting in huge profits. So pharmaceutical, biotechnological companies and researchers are using IK for their self-interest and for their own gain. So next issue is the commodification, bastardization, and commoditization of culture. So according to Greenwood, he analyzed that cultural commoditization is a process where culture is being packaged, priced, and sold like things in a tourism industry, which cause loss of meaning of culture. The immense capitalist agenda and neoliberalist characteristic of contemporary world where majority of the population operated by a profit-oriented consciousness, even culture and IK are frequently misrepresented by majority of the population and were often used as part of innovation and creativity, which tends to be more destructive. So similar to this observation is uh, the idea of Bert et al. 2000, where they argued that in the lens of many non-indigenous peoples, they view globalization in a detrimental way, where it is a more opening up of new markets and finding new ways of quote-unquote selling indigenous culture. So basically, what we need to understand in this slide, and the catch here is, it is a sad truth that the scientific researchers, which have good motives in the knowledge formulation in the academe, served and became a threat to the lives and culture of IP communities. Just like what Boisin 2010 observed, the French, Japanese, and American bioprospecting expeditions in the Philippines have resulted in the patenting of ilang-ilang, banaba, nata de coco, and snails at the expense of Filipino IP communities. But it is a good thing that the National Commission on Indigenous People is now in the context to, to set protocols and guidelines to protect the IPs and their indigenous knowledge. But abuses and corrupt practices is present in the NCIP as the employees of the NCIP manipulates the pre-prior informed consent and collaborating with mining companies for their own gain. So the irony here is that the agency which is supposed, supposed to be protecting the IPs are the culprits on why they are still oppressed and struggling in our society. Also, by opening IK to everyone, one may misuse the knowledge or irresponsibly exercise the power related to it. So unlike other knowledge, IK is different because of the ethical and moral issues which coincide within it. This turned out that modernity, mainstream, and popular culture have often misrepresented and abused IPs and indigenous knowledge and practices. So the question which arises here is that what is our real priority or the government real priority? Environmental conservation and IP rights or economic greed and exploitation? So we, put, we are in the conclusion. Uh, I will be using Filipino language to explain this conclusion. So, ano nga ba talaga ang punto ng papel na ito? Makikitang mahalaga ang IK para sa pag-unlad at sa proseso ng sustainable development. Subalit dahil sa duality ng globalisasyon, 
kung saan nagbibigay ito ng positibo at negatibong epekto, makikitang sa aspeto ng kultura, ito ay nagdudulot ng nakasasamang epekto. Ito ay madalas tignan din sa forma ng westernization and americanization. Dahil dito, unti-unting nawawala ang identidad ng mga IP at ang, at ang kanilang kalinangan kung kaya't bilang pangkontra sa nangyayaring ito, ang IK ay tumayo at naging prominenteng pag-aaral sa, kasalu- sa kasalukuyang literatura. Ang mga mananaliksik sa loob at labas ng akademya ay masusing pinag-aralan ang mga IP at kanilang IKSP. Sa paniniwalang ang IK ay magdudulot ng positibong epekto sa proseso ng pag-unlan. Subalit ang preservasyon at dokumentasyon ng mga IK at IKSP sa kontemporaryong panahon ay may mga issue at mga problema dahil ang kultura ay kadalasang ibinibenta, binabastos at nababastos at nilalagyan ng halaga o presyo. Idagdag pa na ang pagiging bukas ng IK ay malibit na naaabuso at nakararanas ng eksploitasyon. Nagagamit din ito ng mga kapitalista para sa kanilang pansariling interes. Dahil dito, bilang refleksyon, di gaya ng ibang kaisipan, ang IK ay iba dahil sa mga etikal at moral na isyong issue na nakapaloob dito. Gayun din, hanggat ang karapatan ng mga katutubo sa kanilang lupa at kultura ay hindi nire-respeto at binibigyang halaga ng nakararami, hindi nga malabong mawala sila sa darating ng mga panahon. Bilang huling argumento sa pag-aaral na ito, ito ay nagsisilbing hamong sa ating lahat. Saan tayo tutungo? Maraming salamat. Thank you, Mr. Duria, for that uh, very interesting and uh, illuminating presentation on indigenous knowledge in the context of globalization. So uh, let's now proceed to the second presentation, which is entitled Indigenous Peoples Education as a Site for Bridging and Blending Local Knowledge and Academic or Scientific Knowledge, which will be presented by Professor Eric Joyce Grande. Professor Eric Joyce Grande is an assistant professor at the Department of Humanities, College of Arts and Sciences, UP Los Baños, where he handles language and communication courses. He finished a BA Mass Communication Journalism at UP Baguio in 2001. In line with the K-12 transition period, he runs Knowledge Management for K-12, or KM-412, which seeks to support basic education's emerging and growing research mandate, particularly in indigenous cultural communities in the Cordillera Administrative Region. He believes that while research management guidelines exist, indigenous or local knowledge traditions must be the base scaffold of this mandate in the said areas. Let's now listen to the video presentation. Good day, everyone. I'm Eric Joyce Grande from UP Los Baños. The title of my presentation is Indigenous Peoples Education as a Site for Bridging and Blending Local Knowledge and Academic uh, Knowledge. So here's the original title of my presentation. However, after a year, there has been a lot of uh, development, and that is the reason why uh, I'm going to propose uh, a new title. So that is Theorizing Indigenous Knowledge, Research, and Management. So here's the outline of my presentation. As a matter of introduction, I would just like to discuss the objectives of this presentation. Uh, I propose a social ontology, a constructivist uh, epistemology, and to ping as an exploratory indigenous research methodology for indigenous knowledge. Uh, I would like to anchor the significance of my study uh, or, or this presentation in particular uh, on the theme of the AMIC conference way back in 2017. Uh, the theme was Rethinking Communication in a Resurgent Asia, uh, and AMIC or Asian Media Information and Communication highlighted the need to rediscover our roots 
therefore articulate Asian or indigenous conceptualizations and models. So this is in line with Asia as a method and the overarching concept or construct is no less than decolonizing research. So allow me to uh, revisit a few concepts before moving on. So first and foremost, I think I need to uh, briefly discuss theorization or theorizing, uh, which is surfacing or eliciting the unarticulated assumptions and beliefs about the phenomena under his study. Uh, I did or I have been doing an ethnographic study uh, in Cordillera Administrative Region since 2015. And this presentation is an articulation of uh, those assumptions and beliefs that I held while uh, conducting that study. Uh, there is also a need to revisit uh, concepts uh, which we usually encounter in philosophy. Uh, and we usually refer to this as the philosophical underpinnings of research. Um, first is ontology, and this addresses the question, uh, what is the nature of reality or what kind of being is the human being? Another concept is epistemology, or another branch of philosophy, as other authors put it, is epistemology, which is concerned with the relationship of the researcher and the research or the knower and the known. Um, I also have methodology, and this addresses the question, how do we know the world or how do we gain knowledge or insights about it? Uh, the last concept is discourse community or community of practice. Um, I, need, I also need to highlight this. It is because it's something that I always refer to. So a discourse community uh, is a group of individuals who share the same educations and professional initiations, uh, technical literature and the lessons or the insights that they glean from this. Um, and lastly, they have the same goals and professional judgments, not necessarily the same, but uh, related. So we now move on to the methodology. So as I stated earlier, uh, this is a snippet of an ethnographic study um, that is started way back in, that formally or officially is started way back in 2016. So with ethnography, uh, the researcher needs to experience through a uh, participant and non-participant observation to inquire through formal or informal interviews, or we may call these conversations, uh, I mean the informal ones and examining documents and artifacts. So research sites include Kalinga, uh, Tabuk City, and uh, Mountain Province, particularly Eastern Mountain Province. Um, because this study is basically qualitative, uh, I accumulated uh, several documents. Uh, since 2015 all the way to 2020, and these include abstracts from research conferences, articles from journals, and chapters from books. Uh, I also had an interview, and I was not able to um, run away from policy papers. So considering this uh, qualitative data or thick description or empirical uh, materials, uh, I use discourse analysis and reflexivity to make sense of all this. So for the findings, uh, first and foremost, I was able to locate four broad discourse communities that engage in IK. So these discourse communities or communities of practice are actually tantamount to what I call intellectual or knowledge traditions. So these discourse communities um, do not just represent a voice or voices or identity or identities, but more essentially or more importantly, uh, intellectual and knowledge traditions. So one is indigenous knowledge systems and practices. Uh, another is indigenous people's education. Uh, I also encountered indigenous knowledge intelligence. And the last is... Uh, indigenous studies, uh, which is a construct uh, propagated and promoted by this conference, is starting with its first 
uh, conference back in 2008 and the second one back in 2017. Um, next is the proposed social ontology of indigenous knowledge. But before that, I would also like to define what social ontology is. So it focuses on social settings. And these include agents, positions, authority, permanent organizational structures, uh, networks of alliances, and uh, interdependencies. So the social ontology of indigenous knowledge that I propose um, it stipulates that indigenous knowledge is the intersection or the interface of uh, four or the, the four discourse communities that I discussed earlier. So for instance, IKSP is no less than that of the Ili, and this represents uh, represents home or indigenous knowledge, a uh, home knowledge uh, that which um, was taught to us way back in, in childhood, uh, starting in our homes and in our immediate communities. And then uh, the other discourse community is the Pagadalan. Uh, and with Pagadalan, I'm not just referring to schools, but the institutional or organizational knowledge of the Department of Education as an agency and its stake on what we call indigenous knowledge. The third discourse community or community of practice or PAMMATI or faith communities. Um, well, interestingly, faith communities also have uh, their own distinct way of making sense of indigenous knowledge, and that is why uh, they are situated uh, in the model or in the illustration. Um, and the last is Gangannaet, and I am using this term to refer to uh, the various academic uh, concerns or disciplinal interests uh, that we do have in higher education. So. Uh, this is the local term that I used to appropriate, uh, or this is the local term that I used to refer to the knowledge or the intellectual tradition of um, uh, academic, of higher education in general for that matter. Um, the next is the proposed constructivist epistemology of indigenous knowledge. Uh, but before that, uh, let me explain what constructivist epistemology is. Uh, this hinges on the idea that people actively construct their own knowledge and that reality is determined by experience. Uh, most literature on research would refer to epistemology as the relationship of the researched and the researcher, or the researcher and the researched, or the knower and the known. However, in the constructivist epistemology of indigenous knowledge, uh, including research and management that I am proposing, I looked into or I accounted for other stakeholders of knowledge um, in an indigenous cultural community, for instance. So we have the Mangam Ammu, or the knower or the researcher at the center. And in the indigenous cultural community, he or she has to connect with or relate with the maamuan or the known or the researched, the makaamu or the knowledgeable. We also have agaamu or the network or the alliance of those who know or the knowledgeable. We also have agin didiamu or those who pretend they do not know. Haan makaamu, those who really do not know and those who should know or uh, those who should be informed about the matter and that's what we call mapakaamwan. And as you can see, there are gaps uh, or spaces uh, amongst uh, these players of indigenous knowledge. And these would all stand for or represent uh, what we usually refer to as knowledge gaps in research. Uh, we now move on to Tuping as an exploratory indigenous methodology. So I am proposing Tuping as a methodology by simply uh, abstracting it. And uh, such abstractions are hinged on what we call metaphors. And these metaphors refer to certain processes involved in Tuping or in Panagtubing. Uh, 
uh, according to my key informant, um, who is now an IPMR, Indigenous Peoples uh, Mandatory Representative and a retired elementary school teacher, Tuping usually starts with pango or ipango. And this refers to involving the rest of the community so that it would be easier and faster to uh, work on the arduous aspects of Tuping. So with Pango, uh, I appropriate accessing indigenous knowledge by simply com connecting with the community. So this is followed by another metaphor or process involved in Tuping, and that is Tibag. Uh, and this is used to refer to analyzing indigenous knowledge. Uh, according to the key informant, um, the people in the community prefer the smashed stones from uh, the, the brook or this where it's smashed from boulders. Uh, it is because it is believed that these are more likely to cleave uh, compared to the stones with smooth surfaces uh, taken from the riverbank. This is followed by another metaphor, or another process involved in tuping, and this is buggy. And uh with this uh this points to aggregating or synthesizing indigenous knowledge again according to the key informant uh the mason or the agtup tuping for that matter has a way of putting the stones together so first and foremost he determines the mouth of each and every stone and well puts this either beside or on top each, each other to form what we call a rupa or a face and eventually the entire tuping is something that they refer to as a buggy or a body or a, um, is a literal structure for that matter and then the last uh, metaphor or process is purdusan uh, purdusan is a rite undertaken to um reinforce or it's a right that is observed prior to reinforcing or repairing or restructuring or reconstructing a portion of the tuping. Uh, it is believed that um, if a certain portion uh, has been washed out three times, uh, it has to be something like uh, rededicated to the spirits. Uh, hence, uh, a pig or a chicken is butchered and a portion of its blood is poured over that portion that got eroded or that got washed away uh, prior to putting the stones uh, back together again. So in conclusion, uh, the proposed social ontology of indigenous knowledge is no less than the intersection or the interface or the overlap of the four discourse communities uh, that I enumerated earlier, uh, the Ili, Pagadalan, Pamati, and uh, Gangannaet. Um, the proposed constructivist of epistemology uh, considers or accounts for other players of IK in the indigenous cultural community uh, besides the usual researcher and researched. And the, the exploratory methodology is no less than uh, an abstraction of Tuping being uh, an indigenous uh, architectural and um, engineering genius of the Cordillera Administrative Region. So for the recommendations, um, re researchers are encouraged to uh, explore more ontologies, epistemologies, and methodologies of indigenous knowledge. And we can actually exhaust this by uh, examining or analyzing mother tongues more closely in order to theorize and conceptualize. And of course, um, you may consider using Tuping as a methodology in your um, in your next research. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, I won't be able to discuss uh, an example of uh, Tuping uh, as an exploratory indigenous research methodology. So these are my references. Um,
And with this, I end my presentation. And so I say thank you very much. Agyamanak sa lasalamat. And for questions or suggestions, you may email me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Grande, for your first presentation. Uh, without further ado, let's now proceed to the third presentation, also a paper of Professor Grande. Hi, everyone. I'm Eric Joyce Grande from UP Los Baños. Uh, the title of my presentation is Advancing Education Reform Through Partnerships with a Senior High School in uh, Mountain Province. Uh, here's the outline of my presentation. Uh, introduction followed by a literature review and then methodology highlights. Uh, conclusion and then recommendations. So uh, to introduce my presentation or my paper, um, I would like to do, recall that way back in 2016, the Commission on Higher Education launched what we call K-12 transition program. Uh, and these include sectoral engagement grant, Teach Together, among other more specific uh, grants or programs. Uh, on the other hand, the Department of Education um, also launched uh, Sulung Edukalidad way back in 2019. And its aspirations are articulated in the acronym KITE, which is stands for K-12 Review and Updating. Uh, improvement of learning facilities, teachers and school heads upskilling and reskilling. Uh, and the last is engagement of stakeholders for support and collaboration. So in this context, I would like to present the objectives of my presentation. Uh, first is to enumerate init initiatives at a senior high school partner in Mountain Province, uh, evaluate these uh, initiatives on the basis of participation and um, adoption into their what we call e-school improvement plan under e-school-based management. And the third is to extract or to figure out recurring issues that can be mitigated by more uh, deliberate and intentional partnerships, particularly between higher education institutions and uh, basic education or the Department of Education. So for the literature review, we will focus on research practice partnership, uh, which is uh, a framework or which is a model uh, of doing collaboration or partnership uh, with any educational sector for that matter. So research practice partnership is defined as a long-term, mutually beneficial, and formalized collaboration between researchers and practitioners that focus on the following. So first is producing more relevant research, uh, followed by improving the use of research evidence in decision making. And the third is engaging both researchers and practitioners to tackle problems of practice. Uh, if I may highlight, this is different from the traditional way of uh, research partnership for in uh, a higher education counterpart uh, may look for a DepEd or a basic education counterpart where to conduct a research or a study or the other way around, um, a DepEd counterpart um, requesting a higher educational institution counterpart for some kind or some form of assistance. So that's different. So research practice partnership uh, is characterized basically by uh, mutualism. Um, hence, uh, its dynamics or its uh, process involves the following, building relationships, uh, working towards shared values. And in our case, uh, I do highlight uh, humility, honesty, and hard work. And then modifying professional roles and identity. So in this case, the researcher can be uh, a practitioner or the practitioner can be the researcher for that matter. And the last is building a new infrastructure focused on learning. So in this study, um, doing research practice partnership uh, is a way of introducing innovations 
uh, in education, particularly in line with the ongoing education reform, uh, which is more popularly known as uh, K-12. So the methodology is ethnography. Uh, it is because uh, this is a part of uh, a study which uh, started way back in 2013, but officially or formally it started only in 2015-2016 and uh, it's still ongoing. So this is just but a snippet of an ongoing ethnographic research. So with ethnography, the researcher needs to experience uh, through non-participant or participant observation. So in my case, I do keep field notes. Secondly, uh, ethnography involves inquiring through formal and informal interviews. But in my case, uh, I am more likely to converse using social media or short message sending for ease in transcription. So uh, right after a transaction, uh, I already have a document of the, of the correspondence. And then the last is examining through the analysis of documents and cultural artifacts. So in this case, I did not look into um, material culture uh, or objects in general, but basically documents. So for this, the site of my study uh, is in Eastern Mountain Province, but allow me to share with you um, that I attempted to cover the rest of Northern or North Luzon with uh, il regions one and two and car. Uh, I covered nine provinces and 14 cities or municipalities, but at the time, around 2017, 2018, I only had Mountain Province as, um, well, if I may call it the most cooperative and therefore functional site at that time. Uh, participants included school heads, uh, teachers, administrative personnel, selected students, uh, faith communities uh, who have been uh, very active uh, stakeholders in the affairs of schools in those uh, communities. And then we were also able to tag along indigenous people's mandatory representatives. Um, well, cultural masters or indigenous knowledge custodians and uh, another long list of outsiders or others. Uh, well, this is evidently a qualitative study and that is why I was able to collect the following uh, materials, uh, concept papers, curriculum designs and handouts, correspondences or letters. Uh, certificates, written outputs of student and teacher participants, evaluation sheets, attendance sheets, acquisitions or requisition and issue slips of books donated by knowledge management units or departments of research agencies, uh, drafts and PowerPoint presentations, abstracts submitted uh, for research conferences and conversations via social media or short uh, message sending. So, uh, I tried to uh, observe what could be the relationship of all these documents and eventually uh, came up with a synthesis. So when, uh, this leads us to the first observation or a synthesis of all those uh, documents. Uh, such documents uh, resulted in an idea of uh, the status of initiatives, particularly in terms of uh, participation on the part of the senior high school partner. So as you can see, uh, there are four phases or four stages of each and every initiative, planning, implementation, evaluation, and then revision. And so far, there were three initiatives, uh, at least one initiative per year. Uh, we had iPad in senior high school of K-12 camp way back in March of 26, uh, 2016. Uh, research, reading, and writing workshop in December 2017. And uh, the knowledge management function of the school library, particularly acquisition of books. Uh, there were three batches and the last bunch or bulk of materials were transported in January of 2018. So as you can see in the first initiative, the senior high school partner uh, 
was actively involved or participated in planning and implementation. The same thing is with the second initiative, uh, reading, writing workshop. Um, and they were never at all part or never involved in evaluation and revision. And for the last initiative, the knowledge management function of the school library, particularly acquisition and eventually, um, well, the ideal inventory and consolidation of all these uh, materials, uh, they were just involved in the planning stage or phase. So we move on to the status of the initiatives in terms of uh, adoption into the school improvement plan under what we call school-based management. So for the iPad Cup in 2016, uh, by the way, there are four categories, interested, initiated, implemented, and integrated. Uh, interested means the senior high school partner signified interest in the initiative. Uh, initiated refers to the senior high school partner going out of its way to ask permission from the school's division office, particularly school's division superintendent, uh, for permission to conduct the initiative or the activity and implemented simply means the senior high school partner carried it out. So the first activities or initiatives uh, were implemented, uh, but these were not at all integrated or adopted in the school improvement plan. And for the last initiative, well, they were able to acquire the materials and it ended there. Um, no more, uh, they no longer went out of their way to have these uh, accounted for so that this can undergo inventory uh, periodically. Um, so the rest of the KM function uh, did not materialize uh, to make the story short. So this results in what I refer to as um, recurring issues in school-based uh, initiatives. Uh, first is the tendency to regard this as instant or unilateral arrangement. Well, others may refer to it as one night stand approach. So in other words, the initiatives were uh, held only once. So there was no follow up, there was no attempt to have this uh, reviewed or improved for another run in the following school year, for instance. Another issue is these were, were held or conducted isolated from the, the, the usual activities or these were regarded as estranged or foreign from the school routine. And then, of course, the last is these are very informal, uh, so these are not at all binding. However, I would like to report that uh, a memorandum of agreement or a memorandum of understanding was considered at the start, but it was not at all pursued. So in conclusion, uh, those three initiatives were uh, essentially in harmony with education policies. Uh, particularly policies on research. Uh, it is because there were all meant, I, I mean, these were all meant to support uh, the research mandate uh, in this particular senior high school partner. However, the, the connections are very informal and therefore these are not adopted and therefore uh, the initiatives were not improved, these were not sustained, and these were not also transferred. So when I say transferred, uh, this points to the idea of transferability in other schools. So if it worked in this particular senior high school, it would have been done or uh, it would have also been undertaken in other schools. So the recommendations include the following. Um, well, researchers and practitioners, uh, for that matter, need to review and um, actualize the state's vision for K-12 graduates, uh, particularly uh, the role or the stake of research in materializing the vision of K-12. Uh, 
uh, second or next is the need to revisit our theory and practice of collaboration and partnership. Um, while many higher education institutions uh, flaunt their successful extension programs, not so many are written about this. And uh, worse, uh, we hardly develop concepts and models and methodologies out of this. Um, and that is why uh, we need to reinstitute more deliberate nurturing and sustainable uh, initiatives or partnership. Hence, we may consider research practice partnership or RPP. And lastly, we need to reflect on these, on all of this, uh, in order to develop situated uh, or local concepts, uh, models, and methodologies of uh, collaboration, partnership, or engagement. So these are my references. Thank you very much. So for questions and suggestions, you may email me. Thank you, Professor Grande, for <clears throat> that presentation. Before we proceed to the Q&A session, uh, allow me to first summarize or give the highlights of these three uh, paper presentations of, uh, of Panel 17. So uh, Mr. Duria is interested in the status or condition of indigenous knowledge in the context of globalization and modernity. And the thing that I wanted to highlight in his presentation is what he calls the duality of globalization. In other words, globalization has, uh, has a positive effect to a certain extent on indigenous knowledge, but at the same time, it also has negative effects. So you can see this duality of duality of modernization in IK. If you remember that Mr. Duria talked about how globalization or modernity popularized indigeneity, and at the same time also uh, pop popular uh, also IK being used as a tool in development. The other axis of this duality is the fact that there's now a growing research on indigenous knowledge, but at the same time, uh, this indigenous knowledge that are being researched are increasingly being commodified. They're being commodified, uh, they're being misused by those researchers who have access to this indigenous knowledge. So I think that's an important uh, result of Mr. Duria's paper. Now uh, let's proceed to my brief summary of Mr. Uh, Professor Grande's first presentation, which is about uh, indigenous knowledge in the context of uh, research and management. And the conclusions that he was able to forward are the following. He forwarded an, a social ontology, which basically uh, attempts to define what indigenous knowledge is and the conclusion of Professor Grand is that IK could be understood as the intersection of these four discourse communities that he discovered in, uh, in his study of uh, the Cordilleras. He also forwarded a constructionist epistemology, which tells us that these indigenous peoples construct their own knowledge and that reality is determined by experience. And lastly, uh, Professor Grande also shared with us his notion of Tuping as indigenous methodology. Now with regards to the second presentation of Professor Grande, which has something to do with the programs being implemented at present by uh, CHED and DepEd, and how are they being managed or what's their status in the context of uh, the senior high schools that served as the uh, site of investigation of Professor Grande. And it's difficult to summarize all the data that Professor Grande uh, showed to us, but we could say that the adoption, the implementation, uh, the planning of these programs are still in progress. And there's still a long way to go before we could completely, before this uh, 
senior high schools could completely integrate and uh, experience the benefits of these programs from CHED or from DEP. So given this, uh, I think we could now proceed to the Q&A session. And I know that there are already questions in the chat box. So let me first uh, read them. Uh, there's a question here. Are you proposing, I think this addressed to Professor Grande, are you proposing the use of the word tuping for the research methodology or is this also used by the community to refer to your research methodology? So that's the question. Are you proposing the use of the word tuping for the research methodology or is this also used by the community to refer to your research methodology? Professor Grande, do you have an answer okay. to the question? Uh, good morning. I hope I can be heard. And I hope yes, my voice is audible. You. Yes, um, Professor. Yeah. Uh, for now, Tuping is uh, a proposed uh, exploratory indigenous research methodology. Uh, so it has not yet been uh, popularized. Uh, it's uh, at its uh, proposal stage. And how I wish this would be adopted by at least the research courses in senior high schools, especially when it comes to qualitative research. And this is also something that I can present or uh, share in my communication uh, research courses because communication studies since 2017 uh, has been very aggressive in uh, promoting the elicitation and articulation of uh, indigenous concepts, methodologies, and models. So that's all I can say about it for now. Thank you for that, Professor Grande. There's a discourse here or conversation here in the chat box about the word tuping itself. Could okay. you perhaps elaborate what tuping is for uh, us who are not familiar with the term? Uh, tuping is practically the reprop technology or practice, uh, the bricklaying practice, which is essentially the foundation of the renowned rice terraces all throughout the Cordillera administrative region. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Professor. Here's another question. As educators, do the youth of today still find value? and importance in ICAs, and is there hope that these ICAs will be preserved and transferred to the succeeding generations? I think this could be addressed to both of our speakers. So for both Professor Grande or Mr. Doria could respond to the question. So do the youth of today still find value and importance in ICAs, and is there hope that these ICAs will be preserved and transferred to the succeeding generations. Uh, yeah, you can go, uh, Mr. Doria. Hi, good, good morning. Good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you, Vlad, uh, for uh, the question. Sino ba nagsabi ng question? Thank you. Uh, regarding your question, the youth, uh, the, my answer is uh, yes, still. Uh, meron pa rin, uh, may, may, meron pa rin na pag pag usbong ng pang, pag papaalaga sa kultura sa ating mga kabataan subalit ito nga inawawala dahil na nga din dun sa uh, duality ng globalisasyon na ating na discuss na dun sa aking paper pero ang mahalaga nating makita dito ay kung paano magagawa ng paraan para mas mapanatili ang pa, ang pang, pangangalaga sa kultura at ito ay makikita natin na hindi sa paggawa ng research ng mga panlabas quote and quote panlabas sorry sa aking terminolohiya at sa aking mga sinasabi dito ng argumento subalit na, nagagamit kasi ng mga academician gaya ng sinabi ni Posey 1996 nagagamit ng academician at maging mga kapitalista ang karunungan ng mga ating uh, mga ating mga katutubo para sa kanilang pansariling interes ang pwede natin gawin bilang academician, instead of tayo ang gumawa ng research sa kanila, madami tayong extension projects, madami tayong extension activities. What 
uh, one one activity or project that we can do is to make them ca or capacitate them on doing researches or document their uh, uh, capacitate them to document their own activities and knowledges for their own uh, community. Kasi ang nangyayari, uh, based on my experience, we do indigenous knowledge, uh, IKSP, we document IKSP, and uh, we uh, uh, ask for the FPIC to the NCIP, and we will bring back that to the community, which is a good thing. Pero kung pwede din naman na i-direct na natin, na at least yung mangyayari, uh, ang gagawa ng research mismo, ang gagawa ng dokumentasyon mismo ay ang mismo mga katutubo na magagamit nila mismo sa kanilang pansariling kalinangan. At uh, ito'y mapapanatili sa mga kabataan na ito'y na, nagawa na sa ads DPP, if you are aware with the ads DPP ng NCIP, ito ginagawa nila sa mga katutubo na, ginag, na pinayayabong nila para sa mga kabataan para mas mapanatili at hindi ito may magkaroon ng misrepresentation at yung edukasyon para sa mga katutubo para sa kanilang pansariling kalinangan ay mapapanatili uh, pero yun nga siya sabi ko sa dulo ito ay mag nagsisilbing hamon sa ating lahat saan tayo tutungo saan tayo tutungo sa, sa nalandas na ating tatahakin kasi yun yung magiging uh, challenges kasi uh, ano ba yung tingin natin sa mga katutubo pa kasi nag diyan napapasok yung idea ni Randall Collins na na uh, credential society na wala kasi silang kapasidad yun yung nagiging problema but paano mo nalaman na walang kapasidad ang mga katutubo wala uh, walang kapasidad ang mga IP kung hindi na, hindi mo pa nakikita na susubukan yung kanilang kinukuha mo nga yung knowledge nila kinukuha mo nga yung experiences nila kinukuha mo nga yung IKSP nila paano mawawalan sila ng credibility code and code so yun po thank you uh, Jerski for that uh, wonderful answer uh, professor Grandi, do you have a response to uh, the same question yes. I, I have something to share regarding the the question yeah uh, one is i would like as all to go back to the introduction of my second presentation, uh, my research on knowledge uh, management uh, is in fact within the context of uh, research courses in senior high school. So going back to that question, do the young people of today appreciate or value indigenous uh, knowledge for that matter? Well, uh, whether they like it or not, at least for those who are enrolled in senior high schools, uh, senior high school rather, uh, research courses are actually a site uh, where they can make sense of uh, indigenous knowledge. Uh, for instance, in senior high school, uh, a core uh, titled Pananaliksik sa Wika at Kulturang Filipino <laughs> na, na ako. has been uh, a very... Uh, productive and intellectually nurturing a uh, site for them to uh, do research on uh, indigenous knowledge. Um, another thing is uh, the Department of Education has a research mandate uh, and that research mandate uh, requires administrators, teachers, uh, among other constituents to produce at least uh, an action research among uh, teachers and a basic research among administrators. So I think it's not a question of readiness, but it's a quest. Uh, it's not a question of appreciation or readiness for that matter, but it is in fact more of uh, maximizing and optimizing the opportunities uh, to do research on indigenous knowledge. Thank you, Professor Grande, for that answer. It's already uh, 12 o'clock, which means that we should be ending our session today. But uh, there, there's an interesting question here from the Chancellor that I want our speakers to, to answer or consider. Uh, so if you are amenable to staying just a few minutes, we could uh, ask this question and hear the answers from our speakers. So this is the question from uh, Professor Rovilios to both the speakers, there is a strong tendency in both presentations to pit IK and Western scientific knowledge 
as a binary opposition. Are there other perspectives beyond this? Who will answer first? Uh, it's up to you, po. Uh, Professor Grande, do you have uh, a response now? Uh, well, if we go back to the social constructionist uh, epistemology of, uh, I mean the ontology of the social ontology of indigenous knowledge uh, that I uh, presented earlier, uh, I move for an interface uh, of not only scientific and uh, indigenous knowledge, but all other related uh, knowledge systems or knowledge forms. So that question had also been asked uh, way back in 2018. And I stand on the same position uh, in relation to the plenary uh, talk earlier. Uh, we need to be more deliberate in uh, interfacing not only indigenous knowledge and Western or academic, academic knowledge for that matter, but all other uh, existing knowledge systems. If I may cite an example, uh, well, we are all under a global pandemic. And uh, an example that I usually cite is the washing of hands. Uh, interestingly, the indigenous community that I work with in Kalinga has an indigenous notion of washing of hands. So that, that accounts for the home knowledge. And then for the iPad or the institutional or organizational knowledge of the education system, they also have this program as regards the washing of hands. So moving on, faith communities, particularly those who are kin with, uh, those who are kin with the Hebrew roots of the Christian faith would also invoke uh, a, a biblical interpretation or analysis of the washing of hands. And then that accounts for what I call uh, IKI, Indigenous Knowledge Intelligence. And then lastly, IS, of course, uh, health experts and practitioners would also have another way of making sense of the washing of hands. So uh, again, I am not for dichotomizing or alienating one tradition from the other, but uh, trying to integrate and uh, locating the convergence or the interface of all this so that uh, we would have a broader uh, perspective and understanding of what IK this uh, essentially is. Thank you, Professor Grande. Uh, Jerski, oh. you have a response? <clears throat> okay, uh, thank you, Chansey, for that uh, question. Uh, actually, I already presented that in my, uh, not, not presented, I talked about it in my paper, uh, the idea of Lutfa, where he generated the uh, different views on how we look at IK. So in, the, in that view, he specified three things. First is indigenism, where it look at IK as a, a good, good thing for the development process or sustainable development process. Uh, on the modernism, it look at IK as detrimental to development. But in his third view, which is the, the, the quote-unquote best part on, on how we look at a uh, at IK and Western knowledge or scientific knowledge is that it cannot be delineated with each other. It goes hand in hand. That's why uh, in one of my example on Dub, on the example of Dub uh, study in the small cultivation in uh, Southeast Asian region, uh, a small rubber cultivation in Southeast Asian region, it is seen that it is a good practice or indigenous practice, but it cannot be indigenous in nature because it already uh, quote unquote touch with Western or scientific knowledge during the 15th century. So yeah, it's a matter of colonization process. So what we can look here is that there's the idea of a Lutfa 2006 that we have the idea of a uh, third view that we, we, we Western, Western knowledge and uh, indigenous knowledge goes hand in hand. However, again, the problem with that is how, you, the question is how indigenous is indigenous? Uh, that, that's the question. Uh, how indigenous is indigenous? Natinatanong natin na indigenous knowledge. But again, it cannot be delineated with each other as uh, suggested by Lutfa uh, 2006. Yun po. Yeah, thank you for the, your answers, professors. 
uh, I just wanted to contribute something to, to the discourse about the, the contrast between indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge because I think the issue the issue rests on how do we understand the term knowledge that is both present in these concepts. Because if you look at scientific knowledge, they have a very specific conception of what knowledge is yeah. in the context of science. And they say that it's yeah, just, huh? traditionally it's justified true belief. And that scientific knowledge for them or that science, that, that is knowledge for them in the context of science. Now the question <laughs> is, does indigenous knowledge also conceive knowledge in that way? Or is it conceiving, uh, is it, or is it, or is it conceptually different? So I think uh, th that's one important issue or debate that needs to be settled first before we could answer the question of whether we could really dichotomize them or we could interface them with each other. Uh, this, there's another question here, and I think we could stand, we could extend the open the session until twelve fifteen. So uh, I think we could still entertain some of the questions in the chat box. To Professor uh, Duria, some scholars say that all of us were IPs in the past, but most adapted to the changes. For example, the Ilocanos and the Igorots had the same practices during the pre-colonial period, but the Ilocanos changed because they were converted to Christianity. Should Ilocanos be also encouraged to go back to, the, to their pre-colonial practices? Okay, uh, for that question, uh, the answer is no. They, they, don't, don't, they don't need to go back to their pre-colonial practices. What I mean in my study or what I mean in my uh, presentation is that we locate status we locate the, the status of indigenous knowledge in the contemporary world we know uh, this is so cliche but a uh, change is constant but what we need to understand is that we could um, document we could study indigenous knowledge in the perspective of the indigenous people themselves not we researchers. Uh, uh, I'm not against with uh, researchers doing research on IK. However, on based on my uh, study, based on my paper, it has been commoditized, commodified throughout the years because of and even used by uh, capit capitalist uh, people. Because as, as just like what we seen in the, in today's context, we are in a neoliberalist economy. We are in a capitalist uh, economy. So what I am saying is that instead of us doing research on them, one thing that we can do as uh, researchers or even uh, academicians or extension workers or government or private sector as a whole is to capacitate them on themselves, to give them the autonomy, to give them the rights, to give them the, the, the capacity to rule themselves over their land. And that, and that we can do that if we capacitate them, if we give them uh, uh, suitable developmental projects that they can use to uplift their lives. So what I am saying that in my that in my paper, not not go back to the pre-colonial age, not uh, because we are the, the world is changing. It's so cliche. We are we are in the uh, contemporary world already, but. Those are the things that we can do to, to, to preserve, to preserve culture, to preserve uh, their identity. And we can do that, uh, we can easily do that if it will be coming from their themselves. And that is also a way of decolonizing research. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Jerski, for that answer. So as much as we want to still entertain other questions, I think, uh, we could end the session now since it's already at 12, uh, 12 15. And I know that we still need to get our lunch to have energy for the afternoon session. So, again, thank you for attending our uh, panel 17.